That's what they're supposed to look like. That is a big old Lycoming parallel, I'm sorry, uh, angle head cylinder. These are really nice cylinders, they're my favorite. They're the ones that usually last the longest and don't crack. That's what it looks like new. Well, you should know, you have one. All right. The valves are not parallel. They actually come in at an angle. So you have a parallel head and this is angle head. Okay, well we're going to talk this week about the top end. Last week we talked about the bottom end, which, except for the camshaft. This week we'll talk about the top end and the, crank, and the camshaft. So, um, hey, just to let you know too, uh, we're going to extend this class for two days. So the actual last day will be, we'll extend, it was going to end in like in the middle of the week, but now we're going to go all the way to Friday. So that gives you that much time to get your engine done. Yeah. So an extra, well it's not an extra week, it's an extra two days. All right, here we go. We are going to start with talking about the top end. We're going to talk about pistons. Pistons. Well, what the heck is a piston? You did what in your cup? A piston, a plunger that moves up and down in the cylinder barrel. But you probably knew that. A plunger. That moves up and down in the cylinder. Cylinder barrel. And let's go back to this right here. Since we didn't make it very far, did we? Okay, so if we look at some of the things, obviously what are we talking about right here is the Piston, this is what? Piston pin. We don't really call it a wrist pin in aviation. Piston pin. But if you said wrist pin, I'll know what you're talking about. I don't make a big deal of it. Uh, what are these right here? They are gaskets. Intake gasket, exhaust gasket. What is this ring right here? Cylinder Yeah, the cylinder base gasket. And these are pushrod tube gaskets. Okay, so this right here this part is called the head. The whole thing is not the head. So if you talk about the cylinder head, I'm gonna assume you're talking about this part up here that's made out of aluminum. And if you're talking about uh, down here, I would assume you're talking about the barrel. The barrel is made of steel, top is made out, that sounds like a ticker thing. Bottom is made out of rubber, tops are made out of springs. The top is made out of uh, aluminum, bottom is made out of steel, and it is screwed together. We're gonna talk about all that as we go, so you don't have to worry about writing it down. Um, <clears throat> which you may not be able to see real well is there's this little protrusion right there. And that is like a piece of rubber that has little teeth on it that have been hammered into this cylinder. And that's called a cylinder fin stabilizer. So if you run across that and you're, uh, you're reading there, that's a, that's a cylinder fin stabilizer. And there's one on the other side. Uh, is this the intake or the exhaust port? Intake. How do you know? Intake. Doesn't have studs. Doesn't have studs? Yeah. Well, that's how I would tell too, but <clears throat> because Lycoming had a service instruction where they pulled the studs out and wanted you to use bolts. But other than that, how would I know? It doesn't have any fins right here, so this side's running hot or cold? Oh. Cold, and this side has a lot of fins, so this must be the oh. exhaust side. What is this little elbow sticking out? That's the oil drain back too. So you guys have that on your cylinders too, a little... Well, that's an oil drain back tube. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, well, that's about all we can see with this one. What goes inside this hole? Rock shaft. Yeah, because they're angled. Oops. That. Okay, so it's piston. And what else we got here? <coughs> what does the piston do? It transmits the force of... The burning and expanding gases to the cylinder, uh, in the cylinder to the connecting rod. So transmits, transmits force of the burning, of the burning and expanding gases which stroke is that on? Power in the cylinder is the cylinder the top or the bottom? 
for the whole thing. It's the whole thing. In the cylinder two to the congrod. In the industry, uh, there's such a thing as called a stud assembly. A stud assembly is this right here without any valves in it. It's just the raw cylinder. In case you ever need to know that. Uh, where are we at here? Oh, here we go. Some good facts here about about 500 psi um, with a range of 300 psi to over 1,000 psi. That's race engines, mostly the 1,000 when you get up way up on there. Uh, what are they made out of? Made of aluminum, sort of. Aluminum alloy. <clears throat> How many guys have we, people we have in here have taken apart car engines? Mm -hmm. What's different about the pistons that you're working with here? They're huge. They're huge. <laughs> they're really big, huh? Big. And they're a lot bigger. So, um, the heads of the piston, the head of the piston, is generally thicker than automotive. Thicker than, care to guess why? Temperature, temperature how about that? Um, what about temperature? Let's talk about that. Um, I don't want to say Air cooled, there we go, because because aircraft, well, we could say auto, auto is water cooled. So you can control the temperature much, much easier. Um, while aircraft, aircraft is air cooled. Uh, the material, well, I said they're made out of aluminum alloy, but to be more specific, Forged, forged 4130 aluminum. Um, <clears throat> majority are forged. Majority are forged or to cast. Um, which I have one, oops, 132 is the material. Not that I'm going to ask you later, but 132. What's the difference in casting and forging? So now that I brought it up, the process of it forged is a lot stronger. Cast versus forging. Uh, cast. The material is heated above its melting temperature and poured into a mold where it solidifies. Remember the terms we used investment cast per mold or sand cast? So you picture molten metal and you have your, your uh, mold and you just pour mm -hmm. it in there. So mm -hmm. that's casting. Forged is, it's physically, well, you, I believe you sort of uh, cast a little bit. But anyway, it's forced into shape uh, while well, it's still is in a solid format. You agree with that? Yeah. So it's high pressure and now it may be really hot. But so let me see, what can we say about that? Cast, cast is, uh, let me see. Cast material is molten is uh, liquid 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 and poured into a mold like making Jello and forged um, physically forced into shape. How's that sound? physically forced into shape. <clears throat> Forgings normally have less surface porosity, finer grain strength, higher tensile strength, better fatigue life, and greater ductility than casting. So forged is better to say that. Okay, 
So in your book, there are multiple types of pistons. You got your slipper type, and then you have trunk type, and then within your trunk type, you have all this stuff. So I see this, Let me go back one. Ah, we have all the different stuff there. I, I see this in, in it, and I believe your book just quickly mentions the term slipper type. And I have never seen a slipper type. I don't know what slipper type is. I'm like, what is this term? I know about recessed, I know about concave. So I'm very familiar with the trunk type, which is to say that I believe most aircraft pistons are of the trunk type. But your book throws out this whole slipper type. So I think, well, what the heck is, what the heck is this? So trunk versus slipper. Slipper is also called crosshead. According to Google, at least. Wikipedia. Um, I'm making that up. So, <coughs> aircraft, aviation, AV, oops, A V I A T I O N, aviation pistons. Pistons are the trunk type. Trunk pistons transmit the side load to the cylinder wall. That is the big thing. So a trunk, trunk type transmits the side load, side load to the cylinder wall. All right, what's the side load? That's pretty good right there. Well, if I had a decent looking connecting rod up here rather than this poor example. Um, we have the piston is up here and the piston has a piston pinned through it and that piston's able to rock back and forth, right? Well, once it's in the cylinder, it's not, but it gets a side load where it wants to cant on it. Uh, and so it's that load where it transmits it to the skirt of the piston. That's its side load. So trunk type transmits that slide load to the cylinder wall. So you're going to see a very large skirt, and I'll go back and show you what the skirt is and stuff, on aircraft pistons, as were a slipper type, a slipper, or crosshead piston, uh, have, we'll just put this, have reduced, have um, been reduced, reduced in size, oops, what the heck am I doing here? Size, weight, so size and weight, size and weight as much as possible. And looking at the uh, piston that you have in your engine across the street, would you say that it has been reduced in weight as much as possible, or is it a pretty sizable chunk of aluminum? I think pretty big, pretty big chunk there. All right, so let's see. Ah, like, eh, we'll get into it. Like slipper, S L I P P E R, or like. Yeah, like the type of things you put on your feet. Oh. I don't know where they get it. All right, so what about pistons? So that's what I got about pistons. We'll come back around. All right, so pistons. Um, I probably went too far. I know. I'm sorry. All right. Trying to trying to be slow here. Uh, but to a certain extent, they must be lightweight. They must be lightweight. Why? Um, because they constantly start, constantly start, uh, stop, and change direction. So remember, a piston moving within the cylinder wall does not have a constant velocity. Where is it going to be moving its fastest? 90 degrees that crankshaft. So right in the middle of the cylinder, it's going really fast. Um, and then it gets starts slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. It gets to top dead center. It has to stop, turn around, go the other way. So it's speeding up. gets really fast in the middle. Slows down, slows down, stop, turn around, go the other way. Where's the most wear going to happen? Would it be in the middle where it's the fastest? Bottom of the barrel. Bottom of the barrel. Okay, let's make sure we, we do have one thing straight here. Just, just, to, just to make sure we're on the same page. No matter what. This is the top. This is the bottom. So the top is always going to be near the head, even if it was upside down. 
it still say this is the top. So um, where, where would the most wear be? Top of the barrel. Top of the barrel. Yeah, top of the barrel. That's where the com uh, compression is the highest. Uh, you have combustion up there. So that's where you're going to see the, the, the most wear. So they must be, pistons have to be lightweight because they're starting and turning around. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I wrote, let figure this out. So at 2,000 RPM, is that a lot of RPM? No. no. For a car, that's nothing. That's, yeah, it, it's damn. <laughs> He's not wrong. You know, I, well, actually, where does a car idle at? About 800? Yeah, so it's just a little bit double idle. Um, so it, it's, it's almost nothing for a car. Um, but you're getting, it's two-thirds RPM for an aircraft. You're not going to go past, you're not going to hit 3,000 in an aircraft. Um, that is 4,000. Starts, <clears throat> starts and stops per minute. If the math is right there. Uh, okay, so not only this, they must be lightweight. Uh, they must have high heat conductivity. Must have high heat conductivity. Now, what is conductivity? I'm glad you asked. There are three types of heat transfer. Three types of heat transfer. We have, anybody know them? Uh, conduction. conduction. Hang on, let me write it out. C-O-N-D-U-C-T-I-O-N. Conduction. Convection. Convection. C-O-N-V-E-C-T-I-O. Convection and? Radiation. Radiation. And radiation. Well, let's define all these things in some way here. So, let's think here. So, if we have, we use... That's my pot. Not the kind of pot you guys are into. But. All right, so I got, <laughs> and I got a little fire down here. That's my fire. Fire has a little blue in it, right? I'm just trying to kill some time here so you guys can. There, so I have some fire going on there. All right, uh, let's see. And of course, my pot has a little bit of water filled up in there. So conduction. Let's talk about conduction. So conduction, um, conduction is... Transfer via direct molecule. Transfer. Transfer heat by, I'm going to say direct contact. So which part of this would be conduction? I got this heat. What would be conduction? So if I had my hand, which I can't draw really hand real well right here. I don't have a good color. I'm pink. So you got your hand right here. One, two, three, four fingers. You got your little thumb right there. Nope, I shouldn't have even tried. Um, <laughs> Katie, draw a hand. Here. Well, if I draw a person, which I'm really good at. <laughs> oh, okay, it's hot. Um, well, now it's just a monkey. Um, okay, so the monkey's grabbing the pan right there. Oh, the monkey's got a tail. So the monkey's grabbing the, the, the pan right there. The heat that came from the fire over to the monkey's hand, how did that get there? Conduction. So it went from heated up this metal, and it went all the way around the metal in, in here, and heated up the handle, and burned the monkey's hand through conduction. Okay, how about convection? What kind of oven do you have at home? Gas. I wasn't looking for that. <laughs> but that tells me no. Anybody have a convection oven? What's a convection oven? It's hot air. Uh, it just heats up my food really quickly so I can ah. eat really it's fast. A microwave. How does it? Yeah, that's a microwave. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody it's else? Hot air. Hot air. It's got it, it acts like an oven, though. Because it is an oven. So a convection oven is an oven that has a fan in it that blows hot air. So convection. So what am I saying? That's called a mom. And <laughs> oops, that's A. So A. What could we say? Um, heat transfer. So transfer um, by fluid. By fluid. 
which would be air or technically water. Air or water. So, all right. So, is the monkey get burned on the handle um, through convection? No. But if the monkey put his hand over here, monkey's pink, in this area, is it hot up here? Yeah. Okay, why is it hot up here? Convection. So the hot air is going to rise off the fire, uh, off the water. So we have convection coming up. And then radiation. Wait, so it's convection that puts the hot dog in the water and it waters in the hot dog. There you go. I like that. Would a gas stove technically be convection? Because the flame is not hitting it directly? Yeah. Okay. I guess we could say that. Yeah, why not? But partly, partly radiation, too. So radiation, not being nuclear type, it's, um, well... The technical term is by emission of, of uh, electromagnetic waves. So emission of magnetic waves. All right. So, but you go camping, right? Who goes camping? Build a campfire? Yeah. You're getting warm by the campfire. Which one of these methods keeps you warm from the campfire? Radiation. radiation does it radiates out the heat yes and if you had a really old house and you had the heater against the wall what is that heater called radiator. it's called a radiator <laughs> radiates out the heat so those are your three so all right so it must have high heat conductivity um, then I thought I'd throw that in there maybe I didn't need to I don't know I don't remember why but anyway so it has to have high heat conductivity well aluminum is really great at transferring heat and that's one of the nice things about aluminum. So it transfers heat real well. Why do we want to transfer the heat? Why is that this major concern of mine? No, got to keep, well, yeah, you've got to keep the piston from melting. Well, how hot does it get inside the cylinder? Uh, Very. Very is correct. So <laughs> temps inside the cylinder reach. 4,000 degrees F. Yeah, they put one of those little those mercury thermometers in there and they just ran it for a little while and they got it out. Would you look at that? When it exploded, they knew it was hot. Yeah. No, people do a lot of, you can, you can actually drill a hole into it and, and they do this kind of stuff when they're, when they're thinking about this and testing fuels and detonations. Drill a hole right in the cylinder, put thermal couples in there. It's not like they're going to do it to an engine that you're going to then go back out and fly, probably. These are engines that they're experimenting with. So, all right, so temps get uh, the cylinder it reaches 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, where does aluminum melt? Well, I was just going to say, ah, I really don't know this, but then I remembered... Yeah, because I accidentally melted some aluminum last semester, <laughs> and it melts right about 1,000 degrees. <laughs> so, eh, give or take. I was trying to make some, some plates, uh, cracked plates for non-destructive testing, and this directions told me to heat up aluminum to 1,000 degrees and then quench it. And I had some that were about 3 eighths of an inch thick and some that were an eighth inch thick, and I heated it up to a little over 1,000 degrees and went in there and and I was able to pull out the thicker pieces, but the smaller pieces had already melted. So it's a little over 1,000 degrees. So let's just say, run with that. So if the aluminum is going to melt somewhere around 1,000 degrees, how come it didn't melt? Because it's not direct heat. Well, it's got, it transfers it. It is. It's, it's that hot in there, but it's transferring it out very quickly. And so we think about this as 4,000 degrees inside there. Well, well, let's talk about what is the max cylinder head temp? 460. So max cylinder head Let's try spelling head with the actual H-E. Max cylinder head temp. All right, we're going to go with the Cessna 182 owner. What is your max cylinder head temp? It's 460. 460 degrees. Where do you normally fly it at? Uh, 500, just below 400, like 390. I like this guy. Okay, I don't know what the published is, but 425 would be on my engine. That's where I'd redline it. So my red line's a little lower. I don't like to, well, 450, I could say. So, yeah, you, you're probably very accurate to what your airplane says. I don't want to see my cylinder head temps run any more than 425. 
And I certainly don't want to run it very long there, but 450 is probably, we'll say 450. I think it's probably a, more of a book book thing. So wait a minute, that's a big difference in 4,000 to 450. So where's all the other heat going? Okay. Well, just remember that number one, that's the temperature inside the cylinder, and then it said can reach that much. So, but the cylinder itself is going to be about 450 degrees. Measured where? Now, uh, exhaust gas temps in the manifold are going to run somewhere around 1,500 to 2,000, well, about 1,500 degrees. Oh, would we be at the spark plug? There you go. You're getting really close. Close enough that I'd say, yes, you are correct. Uh, I'll show you at some point. There are two ways to measure cylinder head temp. Way number one is there's a hole right here. This hole right here is for what? Spark plug. Spark plug. This hole right here is just there, and you're like, I don't know what that hole is there for. You can stick a probe down in there. So it's just a boss, just something where they've, they've uh, drilled a hole and put some threads where you can uh, screw a probe to it. You can also put a probe underneath the spark plug uh, as a washer, and it'll measure it there. So between those two places, you're talking about four, 450 max temp. Uh, exhaust gas temps uh, are going to run somewhere in the neighborhood about 1,500, depending on how close to the cylinder you take them. The further away you get, obviously, the cooler they're going to be. So we've got this high heat going on in there. We have to remember that what's going to happen is that heat goes right to the top of the piston. The piston then transfers that heat to the rings uh, through convection, conduction, or radiation. Conduction. There's going to conduction from the rings through the oil that's built up there to the cylinder wall. That's also through conduction. And then it's going to go through conduction to the cylinder fins, and then through what at that point? I'm going to go convection on that one. The air. The air is going to sweep across it, so I'm going to go convection. Uh, but let me ask you this. Somebody finishes a flight, and you walk up to the cowling and put your hand on top of the cowling, and the cowling's super hot. What is that? I'd say that's more radiation. That's radiation. No, no, no. How did the metal, how did the metal get hot? Oh, oh, oh. yeah, radiation. Ra radiation. That's what I'm going to go with. Okay, so we got inside reach that much. Where am I here? Um, huh, I just pretty much said this. Oh, and look at that. I even wrote my notes. Aluminum melts at 1,220 degrees. I was so close. And it's in red for no particular reason. Heat is transferred from piston. And I will say from piston to rings to the cylinder wall Oops, to cylinder. cylinder wall, from the cylinder wall to cooling fins, and from cooling fins to the air, and from the air overboard. There's also another type of heat transfer or something that's helping the piston in there. How about from the piston uh, to the engine oil. Now, how you suppose it's going to get to the engine oil? Splash. From the piston to the engine oil, and then I could say from engine oil to oil cooler. Almost all larger planes, six cylinders, have oil coolers on them. So, how am I going to get the? How's how's the oil doing it? Crankshaft is, the crankshaft has those uh, oil holes that shoot oil at the uh, cylinder walls, right? Nope. Close. The crankshaft does not. Yeah, connecting rod. Connecting rod. So right back here on some of the caps, it'll be drilled off center to go up or down and hit, or right to left, and hit the one next to it. Or what Lycoming does is they have piston cooling nozzles. Let me write this here. So... Um, some pistons have cool, well, first of all, some pistons, some pistons have cooling fins, 
cooling fins um, under the head, under the piston head to help cool, to help cool. And some engines, some, some engines, um, have oil sprayed from the conrod cap or piston cooling nozzles. I'll come back to this. Don't panic. That is a piston cooling nozzle right here. And there's a bigger picture of it. And there's a light combing just right inside. Uh, here's where the, the cylinder is going to bolt onto right here. So right inside there that has these nozzles. Now, these nozzles are really no fun to get out. Because just like I showed you how to get those plugs out of your cylinder, if you don't use the exact same procedure to get you know, the eighth inch pipe plugs in the back, this is just an eighth inch pipe plug with, with the um, hex head on it, really. So now you can get a socket on here that won't strip out. And so what does it do? Breaks off right here. And then you got to drill that out. That's no fun. So getting these out is exactly like getting out those pipe plugs I showed you. You have to do it when the crankcase is really hot, like when it came out of a hot pressure washer. Or, and then you... I use a small wrench so I don't put too much pressure on it and just put enough pressure on it. If it doesn't come, then use a little torch and warm it up and it'll pop out. Otherwise, you'll be drilling them out all day. And that's no fun because how many, how many piston cooling nozzles does a six-cylinder engine have? Exactly six. <laughs> Good. You're okay. As long as you wanted a multiple of six, I would have accepted it. He would have said five or seven or <laughs> so one for each cylinder. Could have two, but one for each cylinder. And these are tied directly into the oil gallery, which is, uh, oil gallery is, is in the cane case where the oil is passed passed through, which you guys have to do a little oral on that. All right. What's, on the other side? What's that? On the other end. What's on the other end? This end? Is it a bigger hole or is it the same diameter? A uh, bigger hole, if I remember correctly. And it gets smaller oh, up in here. That's why it breaks, right? Yeah. Yeah, good point. That would have made a small hole all the way through. It wouldn't break so easy. All right, piston cooling nozzles. Some engines have oil sprayed from the counter cap or piston cooling nozzles that spray onto the back of the piston. Well, what else do we say about pistons? They must have excellent bearing characteristics must have excellent bearing characteristics. What does that mean? Likes to slide without wear. There you go. Likes to slide without air. What, uh, what sliding bearing surfaces do we have on a piston? Hang on, let me see. I got three of them I can think of. One, two, three. So what did you say, Alan? No, I was not thinking. I was thinking skirt to the wall. Okay, so, so we've got a cylinder wall. Cylinder wall, two piston. So we got the piston sliding in the cylinder wall. So it's got to, about to uh, move nice there. Piston, two piston. What else we have? Ooh, nice. Piston pin. Piston pin is in there. Have the piston pin boss to be proper. And let me see. Last one's kind of hard. So I'll give you that. Rings. Rings to piston. It's going to cylinder wall to the rings. Uh, actually, the piston actually touches it too. Touch them? Yeah. So especially along the skirt down the side. So let's talk about the nomenclature. Nomenclature or the parts of a piston. I 
I will let this picture do the work for me. I will not be writing this down in your notes, so you'll have to do it. Okay, so we have the piston head is this part up here. We have grooves. What are the grooves for? Ring. Ring. Piston rings. Most of the modern day aviation pistons have three rings here and possibly one down here. And we'll talk about this one down here. Uh, between here and here is the top land. And then we have uh, between, we have the ring grooves and then I call them ring lands in here. So the land between the one and two ring is here, mm -hmm. between three and four, four and three. Uh, everything below that land down is the skirt. Of course, back inside we have the ribs. Um, I don't call that a piston barrel. I don't know, but they do. Um, this particular piston with four grooves, the top three are always going to be compression. So normally what you see is two compression and one oil control ring. And you can always tell the oil control ring because it has that little drilled spot. So what the oil control ring is doing, well, let's start here, is what the compression rings are doing, and I'll write some of this stuff down. What the compression rings are doing, they're sealing the piston from the pressure that's coming from the expanding gases. And of course, also transferring heat, but let's just say their primary job is to seal the piston to the piston wall. And they have two rings that do that. And now the third ring helps control the oil because you want a good film of oil around the barrel. And that's where we're gonna get into uh, honing and cross hatching, which we'll talk about. But so you right, you actually scratch the, the wall. So if you guys look at your, your cylinders, they're scratched in about a 45 degree hash mark. And those scratches are there to, to absorb and, and hold oil. Uh, a lot of pistons are chrome plated, or pistons, no, that's not right. I take that back, we'll, we'll edit that out. A lot of cylinder barrels, and I'll talk about this later, are chrome plated. And chrome plating was kind of a cool thing because um, cylinder barrels rust real easy, but chrome does not. So not only is it a repair, but it was also an option. People would get on new cylinders, so they would chrome them. But when you chrome it, if you look at it, you'll notice that the chrome is cracked. They, some people just call it cracked chrome. The proper name is channel chrome. So what it is, it's um, my understanding is it, chroming is an electrolytic uh, process where they have like a positive and negative and it's attracted and they reverse the current real quick and it cracks it, this is what I was told. And so you have these cracks everywhere and the cracks are there to hold oil. If you don't hold oil, then you don't have, the surface is not oiled and then you have metal to metal contact and that's bad. So you want these, these cracks in there, which is also to say too, um, I know I was looking at an airplane a, a few weeks ago and, and you know, the, the guy was just bragging. He's like, man, I flew this thing all the way from like Colorado, did not burn one drop of oil. That freaked me out. I want an airplane engine that burns oil. Now, yeah, I, if it doesn't burn oil, it means you're not lubricating the top end and I've seen what that does and it gets ugly. So, all right, so we got all this, let me see. If I had to put one more thing on here, which I would, if I had to, I don't have to, but I will. I'll put this down here, we'll call this one the oil scraper. <clears throat> oil scraper ring. Sometimes you have a ring down here that's the oil scraper ring that goes down there. This particular one does not, but if it did, that's where it would go, oil scraper. So we have compression, Oil control, oil scraper. Those are your rings. Wait. 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 How come the oil scraper ring is like so